guys, welcome back, it's Biggs. Now today we're gonna go another one, we're gonna dig deep, we're gonna go into the into the mind of madness, that's me, Biggs, the madman. Now, the big one topic today is something that I've been working on a little bit and behind the scenes a little bit, and I don't think a lot of people even know about what's happened or what's gonna, the ramifications of what happened, but today it was, it was kind of earth shattering for me. Now, quick little backstory is, um, Several months ago, I was in the middle of building another talk for uh, one of the stores that's asked me to speak at them uh, repeatedly and stuff. And I wanted to do something a little bit more. Uh, I know people like my talks are really entertaining and stuff, but my, my, my focus is always to put a lot of education into those talks and take some of that scientific stuff and bring it down to a nice, easy level and make it fun. Because if it's not fun, there's no real point in doing it. So in doing that, I decided to start kind of uh, retraining my brain a little bit because it's been a long time since I've, I've been uh, in university and stuff and doing the academic stuff and everything like that. So I wanted to try and retrain my brain a little bit. So I started trying to delve deep into a lot of the scientific literature. And uh, the one thing was the facet of cichlids. You guys know I've always kept cichlids. Cichlids have been near and dear to my heart for many, many years. And I'm fascinated not just for all the basic stuff. Everyone likes all the pretty colors and the behaviors and stuff. I just think they're probably the absolute perfect animal to study for evolutionary, for family behavior, everything. I just think cichlids are perfect in every way, except for discus. Discus are boring. Nobody should ever keep discus. If you like discus, good for you. I've kept discus boring. It's like watching paint dry. It doesn't interest me in the slightest. But discus are apparently still a cichlid. We hope they weren't be. Maybe after a few revisions, they'd take them out but they still are. Oh well. So I guess we got to like discus a little bit because they're still a cichlid. But what happened is I've known cichlids and maybe you guys have known cichlids, those that read the literature and stuff like that. Cichlids have always been classified as persiforms. Persiforms are perch-like fish. Now if you've ever seen a perch, a rock bass, a bluegill, any of those panfish, sunfish, you can see the similarities to them. Although they are very different fish in the fact that uh, there are other things that they, one family has the while the family does not, like the lateral line is not bisected and things like that and stuff like that, and other more morph morphological type things. But back in the day, so after, after Persiforms, then it became Labroidiidae, uh, was this, the subclass, and Labroidiidae means the wrasses. And then the cichlids and the wrasses were together because they shared diffused dental plate, the pharyngeal mill, and other traits and stuff like that. And that's how they've evolved, and that's how we've known them forever. That's no more. It's not like that at all anymore. They've messed all of that up for us, okay? Uh, <laughs> it literally only took one search. I ended up on like a wiki page, and I thought, there's no way that this is right. So I actually went into it, and I sent an email to my, uh, my, uh, my dear friend, Mr. Wayne Leibel, and I says, can you check on this and tell me if this is right or wrong? I don't want ever want to give out false information, but it just seemed so completely implausible that it would be even reality. And we were back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, and then I ended up getting in contact, as, as his suggestion, getting in contact with Paul Loisel. And this was only about a week or two ago, just before his show. And Paul came back with an email that said, no, 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 no. There's, there's very strong evidence to, to why cichlids are where they are. And then a few days later, I get a, an email back from him with a co complete retraction. And he'd spoken to somebody and he says, yeah, in fact, they are. So I know Paul and Wayne and myself and all these other guys. And I'm not the scientist like those guys are. But we're all just jumping into this full force. But the cool thing is, and the weird thing is, is that this didn't just happen. This happened like... 2013 happened sort of thing and like nobody knows about it. I find that absolutely funny. But what's happened is cichlids are no longer persiforms. Okay? Cichlids now are cichloforms. Well, that sounds way cooler. They're in their own thing, right? Way cooler. And they're in the subseries Ovalataria, and Ovalataria is actually your little green chromides, a little saltwater stuff. And that's okay, not too bad. You take a you take a, a green chromide and you put it up against like a, a natroplid or something like that, one of those Indian uh, orange chromides or something like that. A lot of similarities. You can see where they kind of come in with that until they actually talk about what the cichlid's most closest relative is. And that's just mean. Cichlid's closest relative is this worm thing. It's Phalodelichthys leucatania, the zebra or convict blenny. I'll put a picture of it up here. Like it's, you tell me that's a cichlid. It's not a cichlid. It's not. But that is the cichlid's closest relative. Doesn't look like that. I think it looks more like this guy here. So you you be the judge. Now maybe that thing does look like a bit like the tilia, Tiliogramma bichardii and the Gobia cichla wonderi and some of those different genera. Maybe the Tilia cichlis from South America. So maybe there are certain similarities to it. But there's only that genus 
of those uh, those blennies. There's only two of them. And how does this all come to be? How does this even make sense to anybody? Well, it doesn't make any sense to me, but when you start looking at and breaking it all down, prior to this, everything, all, all plant matter, all life matter, it was always, always done and, and described and put into these orders by uh, measurable traits, using metrics or morphometrics, measurable things, like the, 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 the amount of fin rays, hard and soft, the lengths, uh, the lateral line, the, the shape or the diameter of the orbit of the eye, different odorless structures or bony structures within the inner ear and things like that. There's always a, little, a lot of internal anat anatomical and there's external traits and stuff like that and things were measurable, but it was all stuff that was tangible. Then with the advent and the discovery of using molecular DNA and gene coding, that's changed the whole game. To me, that's like, it's like a nuclear bomb going off. That's using DNA, it's like an etch-a-sketch for absolutely everything that we know and hold dear. Now, there's no other species on the planet that really cares. I don't think any cichlid in your tanks cares how it's related to so-and-so. It just wants its mate and to make babies and be happy and some like to beat up each other. And that's cichlids. That's all they care about. They don't care where they fit into the family trees and stuff like that. Only humans do that. We put all stuff, we have to put everything in a nice, neat little row in orders and everything like that. Maybe it's a little bit weird. Don't really know. Don't really care. It's not up to me to make those decisions. But the fact that it's all been done, and Melanie Stiasini was one of the people on the team, and she's a very, very well-regarded ichthyologist. Extremely, extremely knowledge and intelligent woman. She's just wonderful. But I was at a convention with uh, Dr. Thomas Waltzik, a good friend from the University of Florida, and we were sitting there talking, and I just happened to match it, mention it to him in passing. And he goes, there's no way. That makes no sense, Biggs. Not at all. And then the very next morning, like literally the first thing the next morning, he comes down. And he goes, yeah, I pulled the paper. I know this person. I know this person. This person was my grad student. I know this person. He knew every one of the people that was involved with that paper. And the fact that it was like in 2013 and nobody seems to know about it. And not only that, was it not only published in 2013, it was published in one of the absolute top journals for theology and stuff like that. So it's totally accepted. It's totally done. We got to get over it. But I remember back in, I think it was 88, 89, maybe 90 at the latest, Dr. Sven Kullender from the University of Sweden, uh, he did a revision of one genus of fish in South America. Uh, and this genus of fish encompassed all our Central American cichlids and a lot of South American cichlids into this catch-all kind of genera. Now, we know that doesn't make any sense because a lot of them, they were all over the place. They didn't look anything this similar. It's just for some reason, they just kind of got lumped there together and they really had no home until somebody did it. But for the passionate nerds like a lot of us, you know, that was that fish. And when they changed it, a lot of us didn't like that. So he wrote that book about the revision of the genus Cichlosoma and it took like hundred species and relegate it to like seven or eight or nine. Was, that's all there was, was left in Cyclosoma. And that became the, the Cyclosoma portolagrensis, or Cyclosoma bimaculatum, which is actually the type specimen, the black port cichlid. And you could tell those, they all look very, very similar in shape and stuff like that. But that's judging from the outside looking in. We should be actually, from a scientific standpoint, you got to look from the inside looking out because there's more structures and things. I see it all the time that Aquarius draw in line and stuff like that and say, that's not that fish. When I kept that fish, it didn't look like that fish. Oh, that's not that fish. That's not that what it is. Because when I saw it, it looked like this. And I'm like, it doesn't matter what you guys think. Inside, DNA and using the morphometrics and stuff, cichlids are fascinating creatures. And they can change and they can evolve and modify themselves and stuff. A good case in point cichlid is um, uh, Herichthys minclei, which uh, inhabits one very isolated area in Mexico, the Cuatro Sinegas. And it says basically it's the, this lagoon that's completely isolated. This species I find so fascinating because not only is it just isolated, it has actually evolved at least three distinct dental patterns on its pharyngeal mills. Not only that, it's actually modified its musculature structure to handle that dental plate. So you have one that is an invertebrate picker and sifts through the soil and stuff like that. You have another one that actually its primary diet is actually breaking down mollusk shells. So it has to have much stronger musculature to be able to use that dental plate to bring that dental plate up to crush it against the palate and stuff like that to process their food. And then you also have the one that's the piscivore or predator and they all have a, that one has a much more elongated snout. These are all the exact same fish. Not only that, they are all the exact same fish from the exact same spot. That to me is absolutely fascinating. Now, when we keep them in captivity and we breed them in captivity, unless we're dealing with wild-caught stock, 
they tend to lose that and they just kind of modify to be able to adapt to what we're feeding them in the aquarium and then they'll have those traits carrying on. They would have to actually be really, really challenged to be able to change and I don't think that's going to happen in anybody's home aquarium. Other sort of fascinating, fascinating cichlids, and I, cichlids is such a huge family, but just one that comes to mind is uh, the, the Nimbachromus genus from Lake Malawi. Now you're talking about a genera of cichlids that are all predators in one way or another, but they all have very, very different methods of capturing their prey. Living stone eye is probably the most famous one, and you see it as it feigns to be dead on the, on, the, on, the, on the bottom of the lake and stuff like that. And it's kind of this mottled against brown, kind of broken up pattern. And it tends to look like a rotting fish, like a rotting or a dead body. And then little fish come by to kind of pick up the corpse and it makes a meal out of it. The only problem being is the mature males of that fish aren't that color. The females are, but the males are bright electric blue. They still have a bit of that blotching, so they have to rely on being able to be speedy and capture fish. So they actually look a slightly different structure shape. The females are heavier bodied, more round, and the, the, the males are elongate and a little bit longer and, and stronger and faster for actually running down prey. And then you have in that same grouping, you have Fuscotaneatus, which is a much bigger, much faster, heavier bodied fish for, for torpedo-like stuff, for catching fish. Uh, and then you have uh, Venustus, and its pattern is, is one of those cryptic type patterns, but it's green and yellow, and it's evolved to be able to live around the, where the, the river outlets, where the, the Valisneria type plants and stuff, and the, the plant life is going to be, and it uses that as actual natural camouflage to blend in with the plants to capture its fry, or capture its, fit, its food. And the food will be the fry of usually other fish, because fish will use those areas of plant life as a refuge for the young to grow up in, almost like a nursery. And the Venustus is definitely going to take advantage of that. Then you have that one last one, Nimbachromus lenae, and that's the one that has that elongated snout and stuff like that. It's a beak and it's kind of downturned stuff. Well, this one is actually more of a specialized invertebrate picker, and it uses that long snout to be able to go in amongst the rocks and stuff and pull out its prey. You're talking one genus of fish with only a small handful of species, and look at those different diversity within it. Now, we could go on and on and on talking about almost every single family or every single grouping or genera within the family Cichlidae, and I think they're all equally fascinating. Again, without exception, discus or not. So, Now, how did this all come about? Now, we're talking DNA. That's one thing we can see where they're thing. But the other factor is they're now talking about cichlids as a whole are nowhere near as old as we once thought they were. Originally, there was this large landmass called Gondwana. And it was this giant landmass where all the continents are all kind of together, one supercontinent. And then Gondwana split up. And when Gond Gondwana split up, we originally thought that cichlids basically split up on all those landmasses, and all the landmasses floated away, and then cichlids evolved that way. But now with this new molecular DNA structuring and everything like that, and putting these fish into a different order, cichlids are not that old. So now the hypothesis is, honestly, is that cichlids have evolved from one common area and then have migrated across the ocean. So now it's easier to understand how they're closely related to that convict blenny and also those coral mines and stuff. So that makes more sense. But without DNA, none of us would ever thought, hey, that cichlid actually swam across the ocean. That's crazy talk. Don't know. I don't really can't wrap my head around it yet as to how that's all working or how that could have been and done. But, you know, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago and stuff like that. And the world was a very different place. And maybe the land masses were still relatively close. I don't really know. It's not up to me to decide. It's up to the scientists. But as a hobbyist and an armchair ecthiologist, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I'm going to keep dwelling into it. I love hearing about this stuff. I love seeing it getting excited about this stuff. But when they did that to my Central Americans years and years and years ago, it took a long time for a lot of us nerds to wrap our heads around what was going on. Because what happened is all our species just kind of got left in limbo. And then Dr. Robert Rush Miller came along from the University of Michigan and started working with them up until his, his, his passing. And he really kind of put some, some light onto where they all were are and where they needed to be. And that work has been continuing on ever since. And there's been some minor revisions to that now. Uh, some accepted, some not. But it's going to keep going. The wheel's going to keep turning. Evolution's going to keep happening. I think we just sit back, watch our tanks, and enjoy our fish. Take care, guys.